Welcome to another exciting episode of Ask Light as Your Daddy. <laughs> the storm that has been prophesied by the intro. Why do you continue to forget us? Why do you, have you abandoned us for so long? Probably true. You might be living in it right now, not even knowing it. Interesting. Don't know who you are, and but I wonder what she means by being burdened by the knowledge that God sits in heaven watching earth, watching people. Is it the burden of existence? The burden of reality? The burden of having to chart one's own life? Very curious to see where the show takes these sort of Christian themes or religious themes, if they end up being that at all, and how it fits into the broader picture amongst all this carnage. Like rowing a boat. We enter the future backwards, all we see are the scenes of the past, and one cannot see the views of tomorrow. That's cool. Very Viking that they managed to incorporate boats into this. If the show is what I think it is, it's not just going to be history. It's going to be a broader take on a lot bigger things that are always relevant. I gotta say, I, I don't know, I instantly love this opening, and I continue to love this opening. I think I, I like it a lot better than the first one. Speaking of Jesus. The Light of Dawn, episode 14. Life is all about love, right? So the siblings. I feel reluctant to get attached to these characters, though. <laughs> They're both in agreement. No price will ever interfere with our brotherhood, unless it's really high. Are they trying to get them guess the meaning of love from the priest? They were sort of dumbfounded by his initial take. Then your love is not, not big enough, not universal enough. They're, I mean, they're really trying. They're thinking. Anita,やたら酒好きだ。その酒は愛なんじゃねえのかい？違います。それに私は。I didn't choose booze, booze chose me. I mean, maybe all these things are just subsets of what he's actually talking about. Doors. That's a lasting legacy for them all. Yeah, Thor is probably is there. He probably was at that, that love stage in his way, and he died for it. Not unlike Jesus. This is how it starts. It starts as this unfathomable idea that it's it's already working its magic and then slowly but surely it comes to the surface. That's a damn shame. You can ask his son though, he's right over there, sulking. Yeah, I love this saying. It ended up being way bigger than I thought. It has multiple meanings amongst characters in the show. There's just no, no helping idealists, am I right? Write that down. <laughs> this is so great. It's simultaneously powerful and hilarious that he's taken it to these depths. I feel that though. When you get hit with an idea that's that's just so great, you gotta just sit down by the fire for a while. Here we go, wrenching this arctic hellscape in Asklad We Trust. Man, I feel like that would be just a breaking point of stress for most people in Asklad's position. That is true, but he also knows there's a line, and if he pushes it too far, these men are not loyal. No! What was the point? Then, what is the point of life if you lose your plunder? That's true. <laughs> Whatever. We're just doing it. I feel like we're due for a reminder that Aslan is a bad dude. He's a bad dude with some really 
Oh no, is this Anne's house? Oh no, Anne, run! This episode is making me really, really interested, intrigued, intense. And also it's giving me a great hunger for soup. There's been a lot of soup in this episode already. Stop being happy, anime characters. <laughs> Why? Well, I got bad news for you because it's about to show up at your doorstep. I feel like I used to be extra cynical of this kind of thing, these kinds of beliefs. It makes a lot more sense to me now as an adult. It's like, you know, what's the point of prayer? Well, it's to aim at something because if you're not aiming at something and thinking about what you want and having visions and practicing, you know, gratitude and flexing your, your muscles, your mental muscles about what is good and what is bad, you're not as free as you could be to consciously aim at things that actually would be good. The more you reflect on good and bad, the more you reflect on what is good for you and good to be, the more power you have. And then the whole, you know, heaven and hell thing, it's not at all going to be unrelated to their actions and how they view the world and what they are, or even just the reality of the world. Like literally hell is about to arrive at their doorstep and it's not not an accident or random or disconnected that what is coming is hellish. But these are really difficult concepts, so it's just way easier to tell your kid, like, just sh shut up and, and pray to Jesus, you know? <laughs> just be quiet and do what I tell you. If not, a monster will come. In this case, his family has done nothing to invite hell, but the hell is very real. And I think the importance of understanding that is not necessarily to safeguard yourself against evil incoming, because that's just a, a reality of life, but to make sure that you yourself don't become that evil. It's like, why do bad things happen to good people who are devout or upstanding or whatever? And it's like, well, that's not really connected. Because Attack on Titan was right and nature is cruel or it does contain a lot of cruelty, but you want to protect the kids from the forest as best you can and nobody wants to be an Aaron. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> very soon. Speaking of Attack on Titan, this is very Attack on Titan ish. This is an Attack on Titan ending credits animation. It's the Danes! <laughs> this is all the Danes' fault. And it's not having it. What's in this tree? All I can see right now is Attack on Titan. Is this the Attack on Titan tree? Are we about to make a bond? Is Anne the founder? Did you steal a ring? You know what, Anne? I think in the scope of the show, <laughs> your, your conscience is pretty clean. Her scales are so pure that... Yeah, her scales are just really pure. Yes, only you, Anne. You are the worst. God hates you. <laughs> Wash it off. Wash off the dirt. I'm gonna jump ahead of you, Anne, and say it's not your fault. It wasn't the ring. Cheese. I pray they just eat their food and leave. But thou hast utterly rejected us, thou art very wroth against us. Just eat the soup and go, please. It's disrespectful. All that over onions. Please let that be it. Let that be the extent of it. I know it's probably not. But I want it to be. Part of what's destroying me and tells me that this is a foregone conclusion is that Asgard has to keep his men happy. And his men are kind of savages. You should probably leave if you can. Oh, it was him trying to warn them! Whoa, that took guts. Major points for the, for the preacher, for the priest. Okay. Okay, guarded optimism. Guarded optimism. Less optimism. Deep pessimism. Deep pessimism. No! Okay, here we are. We've entered hell. We've met the devil. Prince, have you nothing to say? Thorfinn? Yare. Anne's ring saved her. And there's the opening axe. I 
I mean, they, they do this all the time. We've seen this a bunch, but this is extra horrific. This is so, so calculated. Ugh. I feel like if anyone was going to become the founder, Anne would make a really great candidate. There's no way that this show didn't somehow inspire certain elements of Attack on Titan. There's no way. Oh no, and she was saying she felt like she was going to get left behind. She was right. What? Alright, she's in shock. She's just in shock. It's a bizarre reaction, elated by the darkness. Whoa, what in the world? I'm trying to understand this, and I mean, there is definitely a thrill to darkness, and I can't help but wonder if part of that isn't the fact that there are kind of warring states in every human, and those warring states represent something much bigger. It's sort of warring states or conflicting forces of existence itself or life itself. If you accept the premise that what can endure will endure and what cannot endure will not endure, sort of like natural selection or survival of the fittest, but much more broad, just in terms of what is and what isn't, things that kind of match the natural world and can continue to function in it will continue to function in it and what can't will just fade away and be nothing. Then you're left with a real challenge because the natural world seemingly by its existence is limited. So everything that exists comes at a cost, even if it's just an opportunity cost of what else could be. But very often it's it's like other things. It's consumption or destruction and there's no way around that. I mean, as much as people want to believe that they don't have any impact, just to live is to destroy. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't mean evil. It, it doesn't mean humans are a virus like a lot of people would like to claim. It's just that for whatever reason, things are finite. And that's the bargain of existence. It seems like that's just what the universe is. And so then it's just a question of, well, what works? And what avoids unnecessary destruction? But then there's a real problem because if we're talking about life, especially human life, there needs to be a desire for survival. There needs to be an impulse to not only live, but to live in a way that maximizes yourself, you know, maybe maximizes your offspring or whatever, because human beings are just sort of a vehicle for DNA. Life can be thought of as vehicles for DNA. That's the real operator, the real driver on this side of the equation. The issue is that a lot of times what's good for the individual is not good for the whole Whole, which actually, if you really think it all the way through, is probably not even good for the individual or that individual DNA. It's just that it's very difficult to sort that out. You know, you'll you got to have wiring to take the immediate benefit. You have to have wiring to not die. Life is incentivized to maximize itself. Yet if we were to only live by that principle, you have hell, basically. You have something that is not sustainable and destructive and will probably mean ultimately the end of all individuals. Yet that's so difficult to comprehend. It's it's a really high concept and it's where sort of our more recent faculties, our more sort of abstract capabilities come into play, where we can kind of detach from just this straight line, animalistic, survival-based behavior and connect with something larger larger, which is not the survival of yourself, but the maximizing of kind of a universal potential, which includes other people and includes, you know, having a, a survival working state for your offspring and their offspring and their offspring, etc. And whatever humans go on to create that is the next iteration of existence. And I feel like in that struggle is good and evil itself and heaven and hell itself. And when you think about it, it's not one or the other. It's not that any one thing is bad. It's just how it's applied and whether or not things are sustainable and whether or not they're contributing to just the, the benefit and aligned with respecting potential and creating the maximum potential and not having want on destruction. And if you're leaning too far into the destructive aspect and the selfish aspect of it, then you're in hell. And when you're in full alignment with it, then that maybe can be seen as heaven and being in line with God's will. All that to say, back to what Anne is saying, I can't help but wonder if one of the reasons why the dark side is so alluring or thrilling or can be so powerful is I think human society with increased affluence comes a greater ability to not seek immediate survival over all else because survival has become easier to attain and you know things can be deferred more to the sort of abstract side of things the deeper deeper minded sort of things where we're all connected and we're not driven solely by hunger and sexual desire etc even if they'll always be a dominant force in some regard i mean it's not like those things are not there anymore they're not gone they're still there it's just that we don't really get to explore them as much we perhaps don't have an outlet for them even though they're just a very real part of our flesh and blood and i feel like it can be especially thrilling and especially alluring if you are living in a moral way or you are living in sort of a societally fashioned way without actually having a deeper emotional or spiritual 
or intellectual connection to it. And it's just rules confined on you. Like at this family dinner, the father's basically boi boiling it down to a code of laws that's palatable to children. It's like, if you follow these laws, you will get good things. And if you don't do what I say, a devil will show up show up at your door and, and destroy you or torture you or whatever. And so it's not really them understanding good or bad or the potential of human beings and connection and my pain is your pain, etc. It's just following a simple punishment reward structure. But Anne wants the ring, you know? And that is an emotional connection for her. And so I think that's a lot of the time why you see these really surprising things come out of people when, for whatever reason, either the shackles get removed enough for them to show who they really are, or their emotions push them to a point where they no longer care about those rules and have to do really horrific things. And that's sort of the evil of humanity. That's where it comes out, which isn't a testament to the whole species. And it isn't at all a testament to our, our whole being. It's just an element that's always there and it will arrive. You know, you will see it and there's no escape from it. And the only real thing to do is try to understand it and have a bigger connection to it, a realer connection to it than just sort of people on my side, good people, not on my side, bad. I want to believe I'm a good person by being of a certain group, but rather really deep understanding of what evil means, you know, what good means and what it actually feels like to do wrong and what it feels like to do right and the way you can be realized by connecting to yourself and harmonizing all these various elements you know your physical state your bodily desires with you know the gift of comprehension the gift of abstract thinking and emotional intuition and things like that and letting that be a guiding course to arrive at something that is transcendent of any of these ties you know and, and to be free and that's sort of what we see in our heroes like we see that see that in thor's who the priest recognized as being this Jesus-like figure because Thor is very much a human being, but was able to bring it all together to be something more, you know, or be sort of an ultimate form of it and be this force for good in this incredibly dark world. It's actually really surprising to me here what they're doing with religion. I think it's possible, it maybe could be taken that this is a cynical take on religion, but I actually don't feel that way. I think that it's kind of a realistic look at how a lot of people view it, but there's so much more underneath that the show seems aware of, as evidenced by people like Thor's and the priest. And Maybe even Thorfinn one day. Who knows? It'll be a long road, but it's, it's not impossible. He is Thor's son. And I think it's largely that juxtaposition that makes this show so exciting and this character so intriguing. You know, take Asclad, for example, who is the ultimate man in some ways, in a lot of ways, and is immediately charismatic and likable for certain things. Like his ability to command his own life and be a leader to other people and kind of see the cold harshness side of reality for what it is and exploit it and survive and get what he wants and win. That's that part of it and he does that perfectly. But then there's the missing part of him which is the the bigger picture, the heart, the not understanding of what Thor's was saying, the message Thor's has which is that there is no enemy. We're all the same. You can remove the distinctions of sides or factions or causes or whatever if you have the strength to back it up. So it ends up being this really amazing struggle between just the rawness of human experience and, and nature which is not bad in, in and of itself. It just contains a lot of pitfalls versus something more something much bigger and I think I said it last episode but the more I think about it the more I think that this would be a really satisfying trajectory for Thorfinn and maybe also um, Prince Canute is that they have to become Asclad and Thors they have to be Asclad in what he's capable of doing and his strength and power and outlook on just you know getting things done and navigating the world with something more than that that doesn't allow this kind of terrible thing to happen because this is Asclad being terrible it's just him being awful. It literally, I think, the show's making a very clear distinction that he's the devil, right? He's the devil arriving at their door. And it, that doesn't feel wrong, you know, given what we saw him do in this episode. And so what the father was saying at the table about, you know, if you don't follow these commandments or whatever, you will go to hell. There's something to that, because Asclad is hell. You know, he's not following the commandments. He's not understanding the, the connection, not understanding a, a deeper code. And so he's walking hell. He is the devil. And he's not going to get out clean. It doesn't matter what earthly things he receives in reward. He does not get out unscathed, even if his punishment is just not being fully realized and not being, you know, fully in connect connection with life and the universe and, you know, actual truth. Mm -hmm.